data of momentum basis. This is something that uh, we have uh, on any system upon which rotation operators act. The general logic is, is that if you have rotation operators that act on your quantum mechanical system by restricting to infinitesimal rotations, you can extract their infinitesimal generators, which are the vector of permission operators J, and then from them by diagonalizing the, uh, the finding the simultaneous uh, the eigenstates of J squared and JZ, we get the standard, the standard angular momentum basis, which we denote by gamma JM. The gamma here is an extra index which is needed in case J squared and JZ by themselves don't form a, a complete set, and therefore it would be necessary to introduce an extra <coughs> index to uh, resolve the generacies. Gamma, in fact, can oftentimes be an extra, uh, the eigen, uh, eigenvalues of, a, of an extra set of, of, of observables, which are unique to add to J squared and JZ in order to, to get a complete set of community observables. In any case, once we've got the standard angular momentum basis, I mentioned, by the way, that it's an orthonormal basis like this. Uh, once we have this, then it's easy to uh, see what the action of the angular momentum operators is on this basis. Uh, J squared and JZ are particularly simple because by construction the, uh, the basis is an eigenbasis of, the, of those operators. So J squared just brings out its eigenvalue, which is JJ plus 1, and JZ brings out its eigenvalue, which is, which is M. Uh, by the way, here today I'm going to set H bar equals 1 just for, just for say writing, really, but it's, uh, for simplicity. Likewise, if you apply J plus and minus, what you get is the famous square root uh, which I assume you had to memorize in undergraduate school, so I've seen it before. Uh, multiply times the basis vector in which the M value has been raised or lowered. These are the raising and lowering operators. And then finally, one thing to notice is that the, the JX and JY, the remaining two components of the angular momentum, are linear combinations of J plus and minus. So if you know those matrix elements, or if you know those, the action of J plus and minus, from that it's easy to obtain the action of Jx and Jy, and therefore you get all three components of J acting on this standard angular momentum basis. All right, so that's the, that's the basic setup of this. Uh, maybe a further remark about this is, to, is just to remind you that uh, the magnetic quantum number M, it being a, uh, the uh, quantum number of the operator Jz, is something that depends on the orientation of the system. So if you change the orientation by applying a rotation operator, for example, you're going to expect that the different M values will get mixed up amongst themselves. You get linear combinations of different M values. We'll see in a moment that's exactly what happens. Whereas J is, a, is, the, uh, is the eigenvalue of an operator J squared, which is rotationally invariant, and so that actually doesn't <coughs> change under rotation. So this is a point I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, uh, I'll uh, reiterate later on in, in, a, in a few moments. Anyway, this is the structure of these of uh, these uh, actions of these angular momentum operators on the standard, standard angular <coughs> momentum basis. One of the things you can notice right away from these formulas is, is that these angular momentum operators don't change the values of gamma and j. The gamma and j on one side is the same as that on the other side. Uh, in fact, some of them don't even change the value of m. As you can see here, the m is the same on both sides. But the raising and lowering operators certainly do change the value of m. So we can say, in general, that angular momentum operators leave the gamma and j indices alone, but they change the m values. Again, this is, this is related to the fact they change the orientation, but not the, uh, but not the uh, uh, values of any rotational invariant. All right. Uh, another way of looking at this is to, uh, is to construct the actual matrix elements of the angular momentum operators in the, in the standard angular momentum basis. I mean, the significance of the standard angular momentum basis is that, first of all, it exists for virtually any physical system because you can apply rotations to anything, no matter what it is. And so you can construct this standard angular momentum basis. And it's particularly convenient for studying the properties of rotations and, and other issues. Um, all right. Uh, so, in other words, it exists for essentially any physical system, this basis. It may, have, may be more or less useful. It's particularly useful in atomic, molecular, and nuclear physics, where, uh, where we have uh, typically isolated systems where the energy is, not, is independent of the, of the uh, orientation. Not always, of course. It depends on whether it's, the system is interacting with external fields. But even if it is, this is still a useful basis to consider. All right, so to go back to what I was saying a moment ago, 
let's now look at the matrix elements of these, oper these angular momentum operators. Uh, to do this, allow me to take a bra, which I'll call gamma prime, j prime, and m prime, like this, and, and sandwich this on the left uh, of these operators to create matrix elements. And uh, if we do, uh, let me uh, let me put it on on, a, on a, this is the summary of last week, last time. So let me put the the new work on the board. If we do, we get this. For example, for j squared, we have gamma prime, j prime, m prime, and then sandwiched around j squared, gamma, gamma j, m on the right hand side, an arbitrary matrix element of, of j squared with respect to the standard angular momentum basis. This is, first of all, a Kronecker delta gamma gamma prime, Kronecker delta j, j prime, and, uh, gamma gamma, well, this is a gamma prime gamma. A chronic delta j prime j, because the primes are on the left here and the unprimes are on the right. And then what's left over is j times j plus 1 times a chronic delta in the magnetic quantum numbers. Likewise, if I do this for uh, uh, gamma prime j prime on the left, m prime, and then jz in the middle, and then gamma j m on the right, uh, this is the same delta gamma prime gamma, delta j prime j. And then we get m times delta m prime m. These are these are diagonal. These are diagonal in the m quantum number because they're because they're eigen they're 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 um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, we're, we're letting the operators act on their own eigen eigen states. Uh, if we uh, finally take the case of the raising and lowering operators and sandwich these two states on both sides like this gamma j m. You can write it this way as delta gamma prime gamma, delta j prime j, uh, times the famous square root, j minus or plus m, times j plus or minus m plus 1. And then we have delta m comma m prime comma m plus or minus 1. We can take the raising and lowering. These are the main matrix elements that occur here. And as you see, there's a common factor of delta gamma prime gamma j prime j uh, in all of these cases. This is, again, a way of saying that these operators don't change the values of either gamma or j. The matrix elements are zero if the gamma and j are not equal on the two sides. All right. Now, uh, the, uh, this gives a general structure of the matrix elements of rotation of, of uh, magnetic momentum, rotation operators, uh, in, uh, of any generality. Uh, to be general about this, uh, let me make this following notation. Let's let x be equal to any function of the angular momentum operators, which is j vector here, like this. And just to give you a whole list of examples, this would include the components of angular momentum, which is Jx, Jy, and Jz. I called them J1, 2, and 3 in last lecture, but it's the same as Jx, Jy, and Jz. Also, the raising and lowering operators, J plus and minus. Also, J squared, the Casimir operator. But in addition, let's not also forget the rotation operators, which are e to the minus i theta times the impact dotted into J which is another important operator that's a function of j. Those are the rotation operators. Did I say this earlier? I can't remember. I'm going to set h bar equals to 1 here in lecture today, just to say writing. It's easy to restore the h bars. Anyway, let's let x have, have be any one of these, op any function of j, and these are the main examples here. And then if we look at the matrix elements uh, of x in the standard angular momentum basis, so I'll put gamma prime, j prime, m prime on one side, and gamma j, m on the other. The general structure of it is this, is that it's diagonal in gamma, delta gamma prime gamma, diagonal in j, j prime j, delta. Then what's left over is that it's multiplied times a function of uh, j and m and m prime. And so it's this final function that contains the essence of the matrix elements of the operator in question. Now, as far as this final function is concerned, allow me to write this in the following way. I'll write it as uh, j prime m prime, excuse me, I'll write it as this way, j m prime on the left, x in the middle, and then j m on the right. So the two j values are the same. m and m prime are allowed to be different, and there's no gamma appearing at all. Uh, 
this is just notation, if you like, for this function. But of course, I've written it out as if it's a matrix element. And the question is, can we interpret this quantity here as a matrix element? There's a couple of different points of view on this, and I'll, I'll try to explain them. In the first place, just to write Jn does not specify a vector of the standard angular basis because I ignore the gamma here. Uh, the reason for doing that is, is that, in the first place, the right hand side is diagonal in gamma. But moreover, uh, the answer that comes out here doesn't depend on the value of gamma. So if you like, I could just say Jn here is an abbreviation for gamma Jm, in which I drop the gamma because the answer doesn't depend on it anyway. That's one point of view on this. Another thing to say is, is that since the answer is diagonal in J, I might as well make the two J values and the two sides equal, as I've done here, and ignore the possibility of them being different. So this is what I mean, is this contains the evidence <coughs> of the matrix element that remains. Uh, these matrices, as you see, are even sometimes diagonal in M, but not always. So sometimes so we have to say that in general, angular momentum operators are, are not diagonal in M. And this is certainly true for the rotation operators, as we'll see in a moment. <coughs> All right. Now, um, there's another point of view on this as well. And this has to do with the concept of invariant subspaces. Let me remind you that uh, if you have an operator acting on your Hilbert space, then uh, a subspace is invariant if the op operator takes any vector in that space and maps it into another vector in the same space. Well, since these angular momentum operators don't change the value of gamma, gamma and j, it means that the subspace in which gamma and j is fixed is an invariant subspace. Let's look at that subspace. Let me call this E sub uh, gamma j. This is a subspace of our entire Hilbert space. So this is the subspace write it out in words uh, with fixed values of gamma and j. Uh, in our original Hilbert space. Now, it's easy to write down a basis in this space. The basis in this space is just a collection of vectors of the standard angular momentum basis, gamma and j and m, in which gamma and j are fixed, and m is allowed to take on any value you want. The values that you are possible are m ranging from minus j and from plus j, like this. So if I put a bracket around this to indicate the set of vectors, that's the, that's the basis vectors of the standard space. And you can see how many basis vectors there are. There's 2j plus 1 of them. And so the dimensionality of E gamma j is equal to 2j plus 1, is a definite gamma. <coughs> All right? Um, so another point of view on this final notation here is, is that these are the matrix elements of the operator X inside one of these, one of these invariant subspaces, E gamma J, in which we just suppress the, the gamma index. By the way, there's another point of view on this as well. is to say that these matrix elements that appear here could be the matrix elements of the angular momentum operator uh, on any of these E gamma J's for any system whatsoever, not necessarily the one we started with. It could be, for example, a spin system where you don't even need the index gamma. And the reason for that is, is that these things depend only, the matrix elements depend only on the angular momentum commutation relations and not otherwise on the physics of the system. And the reason for that is, is that ultimately this all traces back to the rotation operators which describe the geometry of Euclidean space. And that's why it's independent of the particular physics of the si or physical interpretation of the angular momentum that applies for orbital angular momentum spin and any other kind of angular momentum you want. Or these are, in fact, universal matrices that apply for all problems involving angular momentum. Now, as I mentioned, in this case, E gamma J is invariant under, under the action of any rotation operator or any, any function of J which includes the rotation operators, but also these as well. This is an invariant, it's an invariant subspace. And these invariant subspaces are particularly important in, in angular momentum theory. Roughly speaking, the reason for this is, is if you take your system and you rotate it, uh, you're changing its orientation, but you're not changing the value of any of the observables inside that are, that are, that are rotationally invariant. For example, in an isolated system, the energy is independent of the orientation, so you don't change the energy eigenvalue if you rotate it. What you will do is you'll mix up, that's to say, you'll take some linear combination of these 
of the vectors, these basis vectors in this in this in this in this uh, subspace, and, and transform them into linear combinations of themselves to create a new vector inside the same subspace. So that's why this is an invariant subspace. The subspace is something else. It's also what's called irreducible. <coughs> and uh, so a longer name for it is an invariant irreducible <coughs> subspace. Do I hear a question somewhere? Uh, this is a name for it. If you ever study, uh, if you ever study rotations and group theory in more uh, detail, you'll certainly hear a lot about uh, this terminology, irreducible uh, subspaces. For our purposes, I'll just use it as as, uh, as as language to describe these spaces. I'll call them, for short, irreducible subspaces. And when you hear that that word, what you should think of is a subspace that is created by taking some stretch state and then applying lowering operators to create all two j plus one states that can be created out of it. These are also subspaces that contain the vectors that are that are obtained by taking some given vector and then rotating them. In the same the same thing. All right. You see the original Hilbert space and decomposes into a pro into a direct, actually a direct sum of these these you know, these irreducible subspaces for different values of gamma and j, and they're orthogonal to one another. All right. That's the effect of rotations. Now uh, the um, so the result is is that if we want to make an abbreviated presentation of the matrix the matrices matrix elements of these operators, it's, it's best to do it just in this form, and more fully you can put in the quantum of deltas and then you get the full form of the matrix elements for accessing any, uh, any of these operators. Uh, allow me to, to uh, actually present some of these matrices that represent these operators uh, for different examples. Uh, the simplest case is a case where j is equal to zero. If we do this, then the basis vectors, which I'll just write as jm, suppressing the gamma now, uh, there's only one possible value for either j or m, it's namely 0 and 0. If j is equal to 0, then m has only one value. And the dimension of the space is equal to 2j plus 1, which is, which is equal to 1, or <laughs> one-dimensional space. Uh, in this case, uh, for example, if I take jz and let it act on 0, 0, it just brings out 0, so the answer is 0. If I let j plus or minus act on 0 and 0. Of course, that raises or lowers the m value, but the only m value possible is 0. So it annihilates both of them. Both of them annihilate that, and you get 0 again. And this implies that jx and jy acting on these on this state 0, 0 is also equal to 0. All three components of angular momentum act on uh, act on the vector uh, 0, 0, and just, just give you 0 as an answer. So if we want a sandwich on the other side with the bra, which in this case has to be 0, 0, there's only one of them on any of these, what we get is one by one matrices. And what we have to say then is, is that Jx, Jy, and Jz as matrices are just given by the one by one matrix containing 0. It's pretty simple for a spin or for a system that has a total angular momentum of 0. The angular momentum of matrices themselves are all zeros. Now, let's take the case j equals 1 half, and I hope I have both here in this little box. But this is the next value of j up. In this case, the basis vector is jn. There's two of them. There's a 1 half, 1 half, and there's the 1 half minus 1 half. And uh, jz is diagonal in m, in the magnetic quantum number, and it just brings out the m value. So right away you can write, so well let's see, first of all, the dimension of the space is equal to 2, as you can see. The dimension is 2j plus 1. So if j is a half, the dimension is 2. So we're dealing with the, the case we've dealt with before, spin and half systems is a two-dimensional Hilbert space. And so the matrices that represent the operators are going to be two by two matrices. But the case of Jz is particularly simple because uh, you just get the magnetic quantum number m on the diagonal, which is either 1 half or minus 1 half times 0. That's the matrix for Jz. As far as the matrix for J plus is concerned, well, here's what we do to find that. Let's take the, the uh, stretch state, which is 1 half, 1 half, and if we apply J plus to that, you get 0 because you can't stretch it anymore. And if you take the anti-stretch state, 1 half minus 1 half, apply j plus to that and work out the famous square root in that case, you find that it's 1, so this converts into a 
raises it, the m value up to the stretch state one half one half. The result of the matrix J plus has this form. It's got zero zero one zero. It is, uh, as you see, not symmetric. It's not a dimension matrix, but it turns into that. And anyway, once we've got J plus, then J minus is easy because it's just the transpose. I mean, it's really the remission conjugate, but since J plus is real, then J minus is just the transpose of it. And then from that, it's easy to get Jx, which is one half of J plus plus J minus, so that's one half of zero, one, one, zero, and Jy is equal to one half, one over two i, excuse me, of J plus minus J minus, which is zero, one, minus one, like this. And the net effect of this is, is, that, is that the J vector is the matrix, the matrix form is one half sigma. This is the same identification between angular momentum and the poly matrices that we made earlier in talking about spin one half systems. So those are examples uh, for uh, J equals zero and J equals a half of the matrices for angular momentum operators. If you go into the case of J equals one, then there's uh, three, there are three states. So the states J M. Now there's there's a stretch state which is one one. There's a middle state one zero, and there's an anti stretch state one minus one, like this. The dimension of the space, which is two J plus one, in this case is equal to three. So the matrices now are three by three matrices. You see, each time you increase the angular momentum by by a half unit, you get an extra dimension for the matrices. It goes it goes one dimensional, two dimensional, now three dimensional. Uh, Jz is, as always, is, is easy because it's just the magnetic quantum numbers on the diagonal. In this case, one zero minus one, and otherwise it's zeros everywhere else. Uh, if you work out J plus, what you find is is that is that if you lower the if you lower the anti-stretch state, you get square root of two times the middle state. So the, this is this column. If you lower the middle state, you get square root of two times the stretch state. So the center column is this, and then the the uh, first column is zero because if you try to raise the stretch state, you can't get, you can't stretch it anymore, and so you just get zero. So this is J plus for a spin uh, spin one or angular momentum one system. Uh, J minus is going to transpose of that, and that you can get Jx and Jy by taking linear combinations. So this is a example of the matrices representing angular momentum of various values of J. All right. Uh, now, uh, what about the rotation operators up here? Those are functions of J2. So we're particularly interested in the matrix elements Jm of a rotation operator, which I'll write, let's say, an axis angle form. And I guess I'll put the prime in the right-hand side now, uh, either way, of course. Let's, uh, let's consider this matrix element. Uh, because this is a, a function of j, I made the two j values the same on both sides because if they weren't the same, the answer would be zero. But I allow the m and m prime to be different. Uh, so this is going to be a function of j, m, and m prime, obviously. And it will also be a function of the axis and angle of the rotation. Uh, it's really a matrix. And there's a no standard notation uh, which is uh, given for this matrix, which I'll show you now. It's given by the symbol capital D with a J superscript and an M, M prime subscript. And then we label the rotation by its axis and angle, like this. The difference between D and U is that U is the operator and D is the matrix in the standard angular momentum basis. Some, in some cases, I'm sloppy and I, just distinct, I don't distinguish those two. And here I'm making the distinction between the matrix and the operator. The operator is the matrix is parameterized by the same axis and angle as the operator. Well, this is just a definition of what, what they call it, the D matrices, sometimes called the bigger rotation matrices in the literature. D here, by the way, is, uh, is a, comes from the German Drehung, which means rotation. Uh, and uh, it's now standard, uh, standard uh, notation for rotation matrices. Um, if the rotation is about the z-axis, uh, the d-matrix is particularly simple because in this case, if I've got, so let me turn it around and let's write it this way as dj m m prime of n hat comma theta. Let's make it z hat, excuse me, z hat comma theta 
let's consider a D matrix uh, for a rotation about the Z axis. By its definition, this is just JM and JM prime sandwiched around uh, the rotation operator in the Z direction. So that's the same thing as my angle theta. But that's the same thing as e to the minus i theta times JZ. And the reason this is simple is because JZ is diagonal to the standard angular momentum basis. The JG, JZ acting on this cat on the right hand side is just going to bring out m prime. And then what's left over is going to be prime or delta at m prime. So the answer is, is that this is e to the minus i theta m times prime over delta m m prime. But there you are. That's an example of the D matrix about the for rotations about the z axis. Particularly simple. This comes about, of course, because we chose to diagonalize J Z in creating the standard angular momentum basis. Um, there is a, so, for example, in the case of a, a uh, in the case of a uh, uh, a case of a spin one half particle, uh, this would turn into uh, e to the minus i theta over two on the upper diagonal, e to the plus i theta over two on the, on the lower diagonal element with zero zeros on the two sides. So this is for the case of, of, of j equals one half. For example, a spin one half particle. This is the D matrix in that case. Uh, I hope you recall that when we were talking about spin one half rotations, uh, we encountered the fact that if you rotate an electron by 360 degrees, it doesn't return to itself, but it suffers a phase change of minus one. And that's because when theta is equal to two pi, each of these factors in the diagonal becomes minus one. Well, this is just the case of a rotation by the z axis, but it's actually true for rotating by any axis. You get minus one if the angle is too pi. Um, so uh, one thing you can see now is, is that the same thing actually applies for any half integer value of angular momentum, because here's the general uh, components of the of the D matrix in rotation on the z axis, and it has the m up here. If j is a half integer, such as one half, three halves, five halves, etc., then the m values, the magnetic quantum numbers, are half integers also. They go, for example, from minus five halves up to plus five, five halves. And so when you put theta equals two pi in here, each of these diagonal matrix elements is going to become minus one. So the result is, is that the D matrix for a half integer angular momentum with an angle of two pi is equal to minus one. It's the same minus one phase factor that we saw already in the spin one half particles. On the other hand, if the angular momentum is an integer, like zero, one, two, three, four, then the m that occurs here is an integer. And so you just get e to the i integer theta on the diagonals. And if you set theta equals 2 pi, then all those diagonal elements become plus 1. So for systems with integer angular momentum, if you rotate by 2 pi, it returns a system to its original state. In other words, you get what they call a faithful representation of the classical rotations. That's the same, same follows the same rule as classical rotations. It's only for half an integer spin that you get these double value, or half an integer angular momentum in general, that you get these double value angular, uh, uh, double value representations of rotations. All right, anyway, this is just the definition of the D matrices, and I've only worked it out in the simple case in which the axis is, is a Z hat. Uh, there's another uh, a, a very, a, just a slight variation of this notation. Uh, when uh, one is interested in the Euler angle representation of the matrices rather than the axis angle representation. So let's take uh, our, our basis states Jm and Jm prime. Let's sandwich them around a rotation operator written in Euler angle form alpha beta gamma. Well, this is a definition. We'll call this again a D matrix with Jm and prime indicating the J value of the, of the, of the matrix alpha, the, the indices of the matrix of the M and M prime. And let's just write it as a function of alpha, beta, and gamma instead of n hat and theta. It's just a, a very, very slight modification of the notation. It turns out that these, there's some simplification that can be made in the case of, uh, of a D matrices in Euler angle form. And that's because I'll remind you that this u alpha, beta, and gamma is a product of a rotation about the z axis by angle alpha times a rotation about the y-axis by angle beta times a rotation about the z-axis by angle gamma. This is the z-y-z convention for Euler angles, which we discussed earlier. And so this rotation operator here factors into a product of three rotation operators. 
and we can insert resolutions in the <coughs> between the pairs of rotation operators. And if we do, we get an expression like this. Let's call the M1 and M2 the indices of the resolution of the identity. So we get first one matrix element JM, and we get UZ of alpha, and then JM1, one matrix element. Yes? Excuse me? I, I think you just hear Z and no, it should be Z Y Z. Z Y Z. Uh, yeah, if, uh, take a look at the uh, notes on the Euler angles, and you'll see why it is. It's a Z Y Z convention for Euler angles. Um, I think I mentioned that in uh, classical mechanics books, they usually use Z X Z. Um, but Wigner is responsible for making it Z Y Z in quantum mechanics, and there's a reason for it. Why, why it's more convenient for quantum mechanics. All right, anyway, I'll, I'll tell you in a minute why. Um, so anyway, so these product of these three rotations factor by inserting resolutions of the identity. And the second factor is J1, M1, U, Y, of beta, and then J2, M, J, it's not J1, M1, it's J, M1, excuse me, on the left, U, Y, beta in the middle, J, M2 on the right, and then the third making element is J, M2 on the left, uh, U Z gamma times J M prime on the right. Just writing as a product of three matrices here. However, as we've just seen, the rotations about the Z axis are diagonal from the line just above. So the first factor becomes E to the minus I uh, I alpha M times prime or delta M M1. And the final factor becomes e to the minus i gamma m prime times product of delta m2 m prime. And the result of this is, is the sum can be done because you've got diagonal matrices on the right and the left. And so this is trivial. And the only non-trivial part is the y rotation, which appears in the middle. And so people make a special notation for this y rotation here. This is the non-trivial part. By definition, this is written this way. It's, a, it's another D matrix, but they use a lowercase d because it only depends on one Euler angle, not on three. It's written this way. It's lowercase d, j, m, m prime of beta, the middle Euler angle. And if you like, this is the same thing as e to the minus, this is one of the matrix elements, j, m, e to the minus i, uh, e to the minus i beta times j, y. That's the definition of the lowercase d matrix. Anyway, the result is the capital D matrix written in Euler angle form, capital D J M M prime of alpha beta gamma, is equal to e to the minus i alpha m times e to the minus i gamma m prime times lowercase d J M M prime of beta. And so, as I say, the alpha and gamma Euler angles are trivial, and it's only the middle one, the beta Euler angle, that is takes some work. Um, but that's because the matrices for JY are not diagonal. So, so to compute your exponentials, you've got to do some work here to get this. All right. In any case, the result of this is, is that if you look at uh, tables of rotation matrices, they never tabulate the capital D matrices, they just tabulate the lowercase d matrices. And they're considerably simpler because they only depend on one parameter, beta. There's formulas for them. Um, maybe I'll just mention a couple of them. If we take the case of j equals zero, m m prime of beta, the lowercase d matrix, well, if j is zero, then m m prime can only be zero, too. So this is going to be a one by one matrix. It's really going to be an exponential of that JY matrix up there, which is zero, you see. Well, an exponential of zero is one. So this matrix is equal to one. So J equals zero is what you get. In fact, more generally, if I take if I take D zero M M prime of any matrix, any matrix of let's say whatever I can form the answer is it's just one. Any of the rotation matrices on a system of zero angular momentum are just one by one matrices containing one because their exponentials are zero. 
And what that means is, is that a system that has zero angular momentum is rotationally invariant. If you apply this matrix to a vector, a one-dimensional vector, it just multiplies by one, does nothing to it. J equals zero systems are rotationally invariant. That's an important thing to keep in mind. If you talk about wave functions, they're called S waves. That means zero orbital angular momentum. But it's true in general as well for spin. If the total angular momentum is zero, the whole thing is rotationally invariant. All right. Uh, so that's the case of J equals zero. If we do the case of J equals one, uh, we work out the rotation matrices. Of, excuse me. This, let's go on to the next case, which is J equals a half. For J equals a half, we already worked out in the uh, last lecture, I think it was, or two of them, two ago, uh, the rotation matrices for uh, spin one half systems. And uh, in particular, if you want to rotate about the y axis, here's what you get. You get uh, D one half M M prime of beta. This is the same thing as E to the minus I beta over two times sigma y. And if you work it out, it turns into a cosine of beta over 2 minus sine of beta over 2, uh, sine of beta over 2, and cosine of beta over 2, like this. It's a non-trivial rotation matrix. I can tell you why Bigner decided to use the ZYZ convention for Euler angles instead of the ZXZ. The reason is, is because uh, the conventions we're using here for matrix elements make the matrix elements of the raising and lowering operators real. Uh, and um, that's, that's why we have this famous square root up here with no, no other phase factors. There. And if you do that, uh, then you can see that the matrix elements of Jx are going to be real too because it's J plus plus J minus over 2. But that means the matrix elements of Jy are going to be purely imaginary. You know this already from the standpoint of the Pauli matrices, but it's true for any value of angular momentum, not just J equals a half. And so when you exponentiate these J matrices, you get these rotations. For example, a rotation about the Y axis is going to be e to the minus i theta times Jy. Well, the matrix for Jy is purely imaginary, multiplying by i's and make it purely real. So the result is, is that these ro the rotation matrices will be purely real matrices, as you see uh, in this example right here for spin in half. Whereas if you use the X convention and then do complex matrices, it just simplifies things and it means that these lowercase d matrices, which are the essence of the matter, turn out to be purely real with this uh, ZYZ convention. That's the reason it's done. All right. Okay, I think that's all I want to say about rotation matrices. Uh, I, I did just the zero and one half case. Uh, I'll leave it as an exercise for you to look at the J equals one case. Uh, there, as I say, the essence is to do the J is to do the Y rotation. So what you need to do is to work out the matrix elements uh, for J Y, and you do that by adding those matrix elements for J plus and minus and dividing by two I. And then you need to exponentiate the series. And you can do this by the means that you've done already for exponentiating the matrices as you try to express higher powers in terms of lower powers. It's easy to do. You collect the terms together, you get a trigonometric series. Anyway, the calculation is summarized in the notes, and it's also done in Sakurai's book. And it's similar to other such calculations you've done in the past. <coughs> when you've done, you'll end up with a 3 by 3 matrix, which is used for rotating uh, systems of, of angular momentum at equal to 1. Now, there's one final topic on, um, on this uh, subject of rotations which I want to mention, and that is the uh, story of adjoint formulas. Uh, and I'll be fairly brief about that because we've seen two different versions of adjoint formulas already. Um, when we did the case of the special case of spin one half, the adjoint formula was this is that if I have a rotation with an axis having a form, and I use it to conjugate the Pauli matrices, I'll put a dagger here, but it means inverse, of course, because they're unitary, uh, then this is the classical rotation, actually with an inverse, multiplying on the sigma. So this is how it worked out for the case of spin of half. 
Now, of course, in spin, one half sigma is proportional to the angular momentum that J is equal to, uh, is equal to one half sigma. Again, setting h bar equals one. Um, well, then, in view of this formula, it won't be surprising to learn that for general angular momentum, we have an edge-weight formula that looks like this. It's that if you take the rotation operator and use it to conjugate the angular momentum itself, what you get is the classical rotation inverse multiplying onto the angular momentum vector. And I think I won't spend class time proving this. The proof is in the notes, and it's straightforward. Uh, actually, there's several different proofs <coughs> you can construct, but it's a, such an obvious generalization of the spin one half case that I'll just leave it at that. But it is said these are very useful formulas because they allow you to take a rotation operator and pull it through an angular momentum, which is something that you end up doing quite a lot in practice. All right. Now, in the remaining 10 minutes, then, I want to turn to a new topic, which we'll take up uh, in, uh, further uh, in further uh, in, uh, next hour, uh, which is the uh, subject of uh, spins and magnetic fields. Uh, I'll do some examples of, uh, of uh, real problems there. Um, the, um, uh, there's a whole host of issues uh, which are typically glossed over or ignored in introductory courses, and I'd like to pay some attention to them because they're, they're, they're connected with a fundamental understanding of what's involved with spins and magnetic fields. I'd like to begin by just reviewing some classical electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetism regarding uh, multipoles and magnetic moments and things of that sort. So let me do this over here. So for the time being, I'm going to do classical mechanics and it'll be classical E and M. So hopefully this is just a reminder uh, for you. If we have some region, of, some, some localized region of space that contains a charge density and a current density, maybe functions of position, Yes. Is this also in, in your notes, or it's only appendixes? Uh, no, this will, this is, there's some notes on this. i got to say, I'm not very happy with the notes, and I won't have time to rewrite them, so I kind of apologize for them. They really need to be reworked. But anyway, I'll try to, I'll try to give a, a, the most logical presentation of the material and lectures. I think it's a little better straightened out from the notes. But there is a set of notes on this that's, that's coming up. So. So anyway, to talk about classical electromagnetism of, of multipole expansion, it runs something like this. And so we have a localized charge and current distribution. And here J is the electric current now, not angular momentum anymore. Uh, then this, of course, produces electric and magnetic fields. And the electric and magnetic fields can be represented as the sum of multipoles, multipole fields. And the first term is the monopole field. Uh, and the, the second term is the dipole field, and then the next term is the quadrupole field, and so on up. The next one is octopole, and so on like this. And these fields are, are this is an expansion of the electric and magnetic fields, and they're characterized by the manner in which they fall off of distance. The electric field goes, falls off as 1 over r, excuse me, the monopole field falls off as 1 over r squared, the dipole is 1 over r cubed, the quadrupole is 1 over r to the fourth, and so on like this. And the result is that if you're at a large distance away from the localized current distribution, then it's the first, the first non-vanishing term of the series is the one that's going to dominate. For example, if the total charge is non-zero, at large distances, you'll see the electric field will be dominated by the monopole field, which is basically the Coulomb field. It'll look like all the charge is concentrated at the point. Now, in the case of magnetic fields, however, there is no monopole field because, as far as we know, magnetic monopoles don't exist. So the leading term for the magnetic field is a dipole term, and that's the term that will dominate at large distances. Of course, if you come into short distances near the charge and current distribution, then the higher multiple moments become important, and you have to take them into account, too. So it's really in large distances where uh, the leading term is important. All right. Now, uh, I mainly want to concentrate on the magnetic dipole term because I want to talk about spins and, and magnetic moments. So the magnetic moment of a, uh, the, the, the dipole, dipole magnetic field of a localized uh, current, current distribution is described, quantified by the magnetic moment. And the magnetic moment mu is defined this way in Gaussian units. It's 1 over 2c 
is an integral over the over space, which is just the the the, 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 uh, the current distribution of the position vector crossed into the current. They are like this. This is just the definition of it. For example, if you take a current distribution, which is a current going around the wire loop, like this, then you'll find the magnetic motor of U is a vector which is perpendicular to the loop. You've been through calculations like this, I assume. Now, let's suppose we take this current loop or this magnetic moment and we, in general, we put it in an external <coughs> magnetic <coughs> Then, just by uh, calculating the, the V cross B force on the current, or it's J cross B, you can calculate, for example, the total force on the current loop and other things too. Calculating the force, here's what you find is the force is the gradient of mu dotted into V. The magnetic moment mu is, is not a function of space, it's just a property of the current distribution, but it may be a function of time, if, for example, if the loop is moving around. So when you do this gradient here, the gradient can only act on V, which itself may be a function of space. And in particular, if the V is uniform, then this force is zero. There is no force on a, on a there is no net force on a, on a dipole, magnetic dipole in a uniform magnetic field. That's why you need non-uniform fields in the stern gerlach apparatus in order to get the particles to move. Um, actually, this result, which is obtained here, is, is, is obtained on the, uh, on the assumption that V is varying slowly or that the dipole is, has a small spatial extent, because you're really expanding the magnetic field about, let's say, the center of the dipole. If you could be more careful about this, there's actually higher order terms in this. This is a leading term. For a small dipole, this is true. There's also a torque on the dipole which you can calculate, and this is a mu cross V. The torque is, of course, since this is classical mechanics, the torque is the same thing as the time derivative of the angular momentum of the dipole. Now, the torque brings up the question of what is the angular momentum uh, of the dipole. Um, and um, this is still doing classical mechanics. Uh, the, um, you see, the magnetic moment, it's clear from the formula, is dependent upon the charge, the current distribution. In other words, the charges and how they're moving. Distribution of charges and how they're moving. Whereas the angular momentum, of course, is dependent on the distribution of mass and how it's moving. Those don't have to be the same. You could have neutral particles that are moving around in a circle and creating angular momentum, but they wouldn't create any magnetic moment at all. So L and, L and mu are, are, are different vectors in the classical problem. And in general, the L vector is going to go sticking off like this in some other direction. Nevertheless, there are some simple examples in which the, um, in which the angular momentum and the magnetic moment are proportional to one another. The simplest one is, is the case of a, of, a, of a charged particle in a circular orbit. This is still classical. Let's say the orbit has a radius of r and the particle's got a velocity v like this. And let's say it's moving with constant velocity in the circular orbit. And let's say the charge is q. Well, in this case, the angular momentum l is, of course, m times r cross v. And that's a vector which is perpendicular to the orbit like this. And if you use this formula to compute the, uh, compute the magnetic moment, you find that it's in the same direction also. And that mu is equal to q over twice mc, charge over twice mc multiplied times the angular momentum l. So mu is in the same direction like this. So mu and l, the magnetic moment and, and, and angular momentum, are, are in fact proportional in a, in a simple example like this. All right. Now, the question arises as to whether mu and L are proportional to one another also in quantum mechanics. And the answer to this is somewhat complicated, and um, I may have gone into too much detail on this in the notes, so let me try to just simplify it here by saying that in many important cases in quantum mechanics, they're also proportional there too, although not always. In fact, to be a little more general about it, we can say that in quantum mechanics, mu and the, and the angular momentum, which now may include spin angular momentum, uh, that the magnetic moment and the angular momentum are proportional if the magnetic, applied magnetic field is small enough. We'll quantify that later on. But in any case, let me give you some important examples. If we're talking about orbital angular momentum in quantum mechanics, uh, 
So, for example, considering the, the orbital motion of an electron in an atom, it has an orbital angular momentum. Then it turns out that the classical formula that comes from this simple current loop can be carried directly over into quantum mechanics with no modification. We get mu is equal to q over 2mc times L for the orbital angular momentum. One thing I meant to point out on the board up above, which I failed to do, is that this is a vector, let me break it down again. This, this is a vectorial relation between these two vectors. They may be pointing, they may be parallel to or anti-parallel to one another, but there's a coefficient in here. And it involves the charge. And so in particular, if the charge is negative, then the magnetic moment and the angular momentum point in different directions. You see, these are physically two different things. The magnetic moment can be detected experimentally by interacting with the magnetic field. The angular momentum is a mechanical thing. You can, you can measure that, for example, by using conservation of angular momentum and having it interact with another system. They're very different things. In any case, <coughs> for a negative particle, they will be pointing in the opposite directions, whereas for a positive particle, they'll point in the same direction. And this carries over to quantum mechanics as well. As far as the orbital angular momentum is concerned, mu has the same relationship with the orbital angular momentum. Now, particles, whether they are so-called elementary particles or so-called composite particles, have a property also, uh, angular momentum, which is, which is generally called spin. And in the case of a particle with spin, there is still a proportionality between the magnetic moment, particles generally have magnetic moments, and there's a proportionality between the magnetic moment and the angular momentum, except notationally we write the angular momentum as S, just to indicate spin. And <coughs> you split off a factor of Q over 2mc, which gets the dimensions right. But then in general, it's necessary to put in a fudge factor or a, or a scaling factor called G. And I'm sorry, my Q looks like a G. I'll try to make it look as different as possible. There's a, a, a G factor here, which is a dimensionless factor, which needs to be introduced uh, in order to, uh, in order to, uh, in order to uh, in order to quantify the proportionality between mu, mu and, and the spin s. And so these are the g factors of particles, uh, various particles one can consider. Um, let, let me just make one more remark before I let you go, is, is that the spin which occurs here for our particle, in the, in the case of a composite particle, the spin is regarded as total angular momentum of the particle of all of its internal structure added together. For example, uh, the proton is made out of three quarks. And what we call the spin of the proton, which is one half, is really the sum of the spins of the three quarks, as well as their orbital angular momentum, all added together. For another example, the deuteron is a composite particle made up out of a proton and a neutron. And what we call the spin of the deuteron is the sum of the spins plus orbital angular momenta of the proton and neutron regarded as a two-body system orbiting around each other. The same applies for more complicated nuclei which have larger numbers of protons and neutrons. Yes? And why don't we see protons with different spins? Ah, I mean, why couldn't we uh, go to an excited state where, you, where you've got different orbital... I mean, because you can combine them. Well, that would change the energy, so you'd be talking about an excited state of the proton. And in a sense, you do see that. Those are the, these are the baryons that, are, in some sense, the baryons like the lambda particles and so on, these are the sigma particles. These could be regarded as excited states of the proton neutron system. Actually, in a sense, you do see that. All right, that's all for today. If, if you want to pursue that next time, ask me again, because that's an interesting question.